Simpson matter. Mr. Simpson is again present before the court with his counsel, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Kardashian, Mr. Douglas, Mr. Blazier, people represented by Ms. Clark, Mr. Darden, Mr. Kelberg, Mr. Lynch. Jury is not present. Uh, counsel this morning uh, at 9 o'clock, the court conducted an in camera presentation by county counsel with regards to certain personnel records that were requested by means of subpoena ducis tecum by the uh, defense. And the, those matters, along with the representations of county counsel, have been presented to the court. And in the court's abundant spare time, the court will look over those records and uh, redact any uh, unnecessary matters. And uh, just so the parties understand, both if the court finds these to be relevant to the professional competence issues that we discussed, then the court will disclose a copy to each side, and there will be a protective order that those records are not to be further copied or disseminated. <laughs> All right, anything else we need to take up before we invite? Question. Do you have a yes, Mr. Cochran. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Certainly. Good morning, Your Honor. Just a brief question, Your Honor, with regard to the uh, court's uh, order regarding the coroner's photos. The court indicates that the court will allow limited public ask access to the uh, autopsy photos. And I guess my question is, uh, when representatives are, are selected from the news media pool, they will not then be allowed to take pictures, will they? No. It will be strictly viewing here in court, similar to the crime scene photos that was viewing that was conducted previously. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Your Honor, I do have a, an additional matter. Yes, sir. Somewhat uh, in line with the court's uh, in-camera review. At some point after we complete the uh, discussion with Dr. Lakshmanan of the um, autopsies of both cases, I would anticipate covering the two mistake cases that the court has allowed um, the defense to raise on the issue of Dr. Golden's competency. I need to make the motion in limine formal that I have tried to make all along regarding the other incidents that have been alleged because I need a ruling from the court as to whether any of those three additional incidents is admissible. If they are, I would anticipate covering them on direct examination with Dr. Lakshman as well as the two that the court has already ruled are admissible. Likewise, I would like to know if there is anything in the um, personnel evaluation file that the court will be reviewing in camera which may be relevant in the court's judgment to the issue of Dr. Golden's competency, because if there is, and if I concur in the court's assessment that this has some bearing on his competency, then again, it would be a matter I would expect to elicit through direct examination of Dr. Lakshmana. I doubt I would finish both um, autopsy uh, testimony by the end of today because of the um, court session um, and a juror apparently having a medical appointment. Uh, but it is most likely that if I don't today, mm -hmm. it would be a matter that I would address quite early, I would think, tomorrow. All right. How has that refreshed my recollection as to how this issue has been presented to the court as to these three additional? I don't recollect having read any. No, I don't think any of the materials have been submitted. They've been given to Mr. Shapiro. There are three cases. One is the blue case which is a case involving a woman who was shot, taken to Martin Luther King Hospital for treatment, and she died uh, at Martin Luther King Hospital. I should point out all of these incidents arise out of this primetime live broadcast, including the two incidents that the court has already ruled are admissible. This is the third incident, the blue incident. Allegedly, Dr. Golden identified only one gunshot wound to Ms. Blue. And allegedly, according to the uh, emergency room doctor, who may have been the resident actually, Ms. Blue had sustained three gunshot wounds. 
we believe the evidence will in fact show that Dr. Golden was absolutely correct in identifying only one gunshot wound. We have the photographs of the x-rays. We have the autopsy photographs. And quite frankly, the doctor at Martin Luther King Hospital is simply wrong. And we will have to litigate the merits of whether there was a mistake or not. And I have uh, no difficulty in litigating the merits because on the merits, I believe the evidence will show Dr. Golden made no mistake. So my argument is a 352 argument that this court has already heard, the uh, jury's already heard testimony that Dr. Golden made a lot of mistakes in this case, these two cases, I should say, of uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and Brown Goldman. And they're going to hear evidence that he made two mistakes that we concede in other cases. Do we really need to spend the time litigating the merits of this blue case? Because if we do, we're going to be bringing in the doctor from Martin Luther King Hospital, and we're going to be bringing in other experts if necessary to show that Dr. Golden made absolutely no mistake whatsoever. And do we really advance the search for the truth here, or are we wasting a whole lot of time over nothing when the jury already understands that mistakes were made in these cases that are before the jury, which is really the most important thing. So that's the first case. Second case is the Aaron Abernathy case. This was a child who died, and the matter was investigated for possible shaken baby syndrome. And again, according to the um, broadcast on Primetime Live, allegedly Dr. Golden threw away the child's brain making it impossible for anyone to reach a conclusion that would be with sufficient medical certainty to support a criminal prosecution of anyone for killing this child through the shaking of the baby and the so-called shaken baby syndrome. Uh, interestingly, I received a call from a Dr. Speth who claimed to have been retained by ABC and Mr. Donaldson to review the Abernathy case. And according to Mr. Speth, or Dr. Speth, he told Mr. Donaldson that there was no mistake made on Dr. <coughs> Golden's part in supposedly throwing away the brain, and that in fact if there was responsibility, it was the neuropathologist, Dr. Itabashi. And he told Mr. Donaldson, but Mr. Donaldson apparently then searched for another expert, and that was broadcast. Well, we'll litigate this issue because there was no mistake made and there was no inability to evaluate the case for shaken baby syndrome. I happen to have been involved as a consultant in our office in that case, so I'm quite familiar with the case. And if we have to litigate it, we'll litigate it. Now, of course, the comparison of an infant death from allegedly shaken baby syndrome to the circumstances of this case uh, are hard for me to fathom. But again, we can spend the time if the court wants, but we will be litigating the merits of whether or not a mistake was made. But wouldn't the relevance in Abernathy be the fact that an important sample was discarded and therefore not available for review similar to the stomach contents here? If that were the case, our uh, contention is that in fact the brain was properly preserved, examined, Sections were taken, and the neuropathologist examined those as well. And that material was available for review, and it is not the so-called throwing away of the stomach contents, where basically there is nothing left except Dr. <coughs> Golden's description. And the important thing to recognize is Dr. Golden is not involved with that in the first place, as far as he preserved the brain for examination by the neuropathologist. Uh, the third case is this one that recently came to light uh, Mr. Hall, and this is the incident involving the um, missing thyroid gland, if you will. According to Dr. Golden's autopsy, uh, the gentleman had a thyroid gland. According to a lawyer representing, I believe, uh, the widow of Mr. Hall, uh, she contended that Mr. Hall had had his thyroid gland removed many years earlier. And it appears that that is, in fact, the case, that Dr. Golden made a mistake in identifying the thyroid gland as being present when, in fact, it was not. 
Again, now what that has to do, I mean, this is an elderly man, and allegations were made that, in fact, this elderly man was killed uh, as a part of a scheme to acquire assets or something of that nature. The matter has been reviewed uh, within our office. And as of uh, when I last spoke a couple of days ago with a lawyer who has reviewed the case in our office, um, insufficient evidence was found to support a criminal prosecution. If we have to litigate the merits, we'll litigate the merits. But again, does this give the jury anything of substantial additional information about Dr. Golden's competency that is not available from the two cases that the court has already ruled are admissible <coughs> and all of the mistakes that we're going to be talking about here. Because even when, <coughs> pardon me, when the court talks about the stomach contents and so forth, obviously we haven't gotten to the issue of is there any significance to throwing away the stomach contents, but the court has heard my argument before uh, when we were talking about uh, the alleged gun incident with Dr. Golden, that people talk a lot in the press, it seems, about what horrible things are done in the way of throwing away material without having a basis of fact on which to make these judgments. We're going to give this jury bases in fact on which they can make a judgment as to whether there's significance or not. And my contention, of course, is, is that when the jury hears all of the evidence, for example, on time of death, they will understand that the stomach contents uh, is not a factor which is a reliable indicator at all on estimation for range of time of death. And if one wants to use it at all, it serves to uh, narrow the time of death much closer to 10.15 than it would to 11 o'clock. And if Dr. Baden testifies, as I pointed out before, we will certainly question him about his previous testimony in 1988 regarding time of death and stomach contents, which I will say for the record is not supported by any medical literature uh, that I have reviewed, the most recent literature in Spitz well, and Fisher and so forth. So, I mean, but we'll litigate it. And the point is, is that that's the issue, the significance or lack of significance. These issues of the thyroid or the non-thyroid, the evidence would show that the absence of the thyroid gland um, from this person, when it's represented to have been present, does not deprive the medical examiner of assessing whether or not this person was killed at the hands of another. So there were problems in making the assessment because the body was embalmed to begin with and not turned over for uh, possible investigation as a criminal homicide for about eight days, as I recall, from the general information. So there's a lot to litigate as to whether there's any significance whatsoever to having identified a gland that was in fact not present. Those are the three cases that I would ask the court uh, not to permit uh, testimony about under 352 on the grounds that it would engage uh, the jury in a waste of time for material that is uh, duplicative of the evidence that they will he have heard that indicates mistakes by Dr. Golden, which are directly relevant to their assessment of issues in this case. Thank you. Mr. Shapiro. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Kelberg is in an ironic position. Yesterday, he wasn't talking about the competency of Dr. Golden. Rather, he conducted what I thought was a very effective, or would have been a very effective, cross-examination of the incompetency of Dr. Golden. Today, now he's talking about the competency of Dr. Golden. And none of these are issues that we have brought up at all. We haven't said a word, filed one motion, and we have no obligation in advance to uh, tell uh, Mr. Kelberg what our cross-examination is going to be. If he wants to challenge the competency of Dr. Golden, that's his privilege. And he did that yesterday, and I thought he did that quite effectively. Uh, if he uh, does not want to challenge the competency of Dr. Golden, then he can call him as a witness and vouch for his credentials. But uh, I don't know how to respond to any of this other than it seems like Mr. Kelberg may want to sue Sam Donaldson. Well, sounds to me like a motion in limine, and if there's no opposition, then I'll grant his motion. Well, we are greatly opposed to anything that is relevant in this case. And clearly, uh, Dr. Lakshmanan has put into issue the fact that prior to reviewing the record in this case, he had no knowledge whatsoever of any errors done by Dr. Golden. And apparently it was only 
until uh, we retained our experts, Dr. Baden and Dr. Wolf, uh, to examine this case and point out the errors to Dr. Lakshmanan and his staff that Dr. Lakshmanan then conducted his own investigation and concurred with the findings of Dr. Baden and Dr. Wolf that errors had been made. So we think uh, clearly the issue has been put in by the prosecution and they should not now be able to limit uh, what evidence comes in and what doesn't come in regarding competency. How about Mr. Kelberg's argument regarding the factual dispute as to the blue case, the fact that on the Abernathy case the, the uh, discarding of the uh, samples was done by someone other than Dr. Golden, and that in the Hall case the presence or absence of that gland had nothing to do with the ultimate conclusions? Well, these are all issues uh, that go to the competency of Dr. Golden. They're issues that we have to review re regarding uh, the reports that have been filed with Your Honor as to whether or not mistakes have been made in the past by Dr. Golden and whether Dr. Lakshmanan or his staff were aware of those mistakes. But uh, for them to be able to pick and choose and say, yes, uh, he made these errors. He made 30 errors in this case and in two other cases, uh, one case which resulted in the dismissal of a capital murder case. Uh, Dr. Golden uh, misdiagnosed an entrance wound and an exit wound, and a person who had been in jail and in custody for a prolonged period of time uh, was rendered factually innocent by Judge Pounders. Uh, they have chosen, I guess, to bring those things up themselves to, for whatever uh, strategic advantage may lie in doing that. But I, I don't see where the court should rule in limine uh, on any prior activity in guard, regarding Dr. Golden's competency. They have put it in issue, and we should be allowed wide cross-examination. All right. Can I briefly respond, Your Honor? Yes, briefly. Uh, for the record, Dr. Bodden and Dr. Wolf did not point out anything to Dr. Lakshmanan. There was a joint examination <coughs> on June 22nd. And Dr. Lakshmanan was not told of anything identified by Dr. Bodden or Dr. Wolf. Dr. Lakshmanan saw exactly what Drs. Bodden and Wolf saw, and well, Dr. Lakshmanan identified whatever Ms. he did. Mr. Kelberg, the issue is Dr. Golden's competence. We agree. Your Honor, the court is well aware of motions in limine. I am contending under Section 352, which the court is well aware of, does not violate the Sixth Amendment right to confront and cross-examine witnesses, that this evidence should be deemed inadmissible. And that is what I asked the court to rule on. And I believe there is no basis from the defense to say that the court is without jurisdiction to rule on a motion in limine. If the court is without jurisdiction, then I must have been missing something for 17 years of practice because it's such a common procedure for courts to make such rulings in advance of the anticipated testimony. And the court understands that if, in fact, there's going to be testimony permitted, and just to refresh everybody's recollection, including Mr. Shapiro's, we made a motion in limine regarding the first two incidents, as the court will recall. The court made a ruling, uh, in essence, saying that we were uh, wrong, and I abide by that ruling, and that's why we're going to bring the matters out. So I think I gave a split decision on that. Well, you did, Your Honor. That yes. is quite true. Yes. Um, but nevertheless, we're not here contesting the court's ruling as to those two issues that were deemed admissible. And we're here merely now because we have these three additional cases which we have examined and we say claims are made, mistakes were made. We say either no mistakes, blue, Abernathy, nothing attributable to Dr. Golden, and completely uh, um, unrelated to these cases before this jury. And in the case of Hall, something that is simply of no significance whatsoever with respect to that issue. So on that basis, I ask the court to rule under 352 that this evidence is inadmissible. All right. Thank you. All right. As to the uh, Blue case, since there is a factual dispute that will uh, involve essentially the court and the jury having to try that case as well, I'm going to sustain the 352 objection as an undue conception of court time. Uh, as to Abernathy, since it appears from the offer that is not contested that uh, Dr. Golden did in fact retain the brain and that it was actually processed and handled and then discarded by another doctor, uh, I find also that uh, that is subject to a 352 
um, objection that is well taken. As to the uh, hall matter, uh, this involves the thoroughness in which a body is examined, uh, the amount of time that is spent during the course of the examination, and I find that that, that, that does have substantial probative value, and I'll allow cross-examination as to the hall matter. All right. Anything else? No, Your Honor. All right, let's have one, one brief matter just yes. for the record. Because the defense objected to certain, you know, I think, in fact, all of our autopsy photographs, but they asked that a particular photograph, G34, be used uh, in our presentation along with the photos that the court has ruled are admissible. And I have no objection to doing that. And the defense has uh, agreed that we may also use a cropped photograph G25 showing the hand of Mr. Goldman, which has one particular injury that is not clearly visible in the alternative photograph which the court allowed us to use, which is G26. That's correct, but it should not in any way be viewed as a waiver of our previous Noted. Thank you. Let's have the jurors, please. Ladies and gentlemen, all right, Dr. Laxmanen is again under the, on the witness stand, and good morning, doctor. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, doctor, you are reminded, sir, that you are still under oath, and Dr. Laxmanen is undergoing direct examination by Mr. Kelberg. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, before we proceed any further, as I mentioned to you um, earlier in the week that some of this presentation will be unpleasant. And we understand that it's difficult duty as jurors for you to have to view some of these items of evidence. However, it is necessary that you consider each item of evidence that is presented to you. If you have difficulty or find yourself uh, feeling very uncomfortable and if you think it would be uh, appropriate to take a break, please feel free to let me know. All right? All right, Mr. Kelber. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and, Your Honor, for the record, we have moved the easel again uh, at the suggestion of one of the deputies to try and do as much as we can to shield the photographs from the audience section and at the same time give the ladies and gentlemen of the jury an opportunity to view the photographs. I would ask if the newest movement creates an inability on any of the jurors' part to see what the juror feels he or she needs to see, I would ask that the court be apprised of that so that we could perhaps juggle it a, a little bit better. All right. The court routinely uh, canvasses the uh, extremities of the jury panel for their ability to see. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Proceed. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Morning, Morning Doctor. Morning. Your Honor, I have uh, what appears to be a newspaper photograph that I'd ask to be marked as Exhibit 353. All right, have you shown that to Mr. Shapiro? I showed it to Mr. Cochran this morning. All right. People's 353? Yes, and I'll ask Mr. Fertlow to put it on the Elmo. Doctor? Yes. With the court reporter, please. All right. 
Thank you, Council. Doctor, if uh, you could invite your attention to the photograph, the Exhibit 353 that's on the overhead. Doctor, does this photograph fairly and accurately depict the demonstration that you performed yesterday afternoon regarding your opinion as to the manner in which that major stab slash incise wound was inflicted to the neck of Nicole Brown Simpson? It uh, catches one moment of the uh, beginning of the uh, description of the fatal stab incise wound I described yesterday. And doctor, given how you appear in this exhibit, is it your opinion that the perpetrator of that stab incise wound used his or her right hand to inflict that injury? Yes. And is it your opinion that the perpetrator used his or her left hand to pull the hair of Nicole Brown Simpson and thus reflect the neck in a hyperextended fashion as shown in this photograph? Yes. And if Mr. Fertlow will print that, uh, I think we're done with that photograph. And doctor, if you could step down, I'm going to put back uh, and take the pointer with you, please. All right, Mr. Calvert, if you just wait for opposing counsel and their experts to uh, position themselves. And, Your Honor, as uh, we discussed with Mr. Cochran, we're going to have some easels up, and there's going to have to be some movement um, to allow everybody to see everything and at the same time have certain exhibits uh, presented for the jury's observation. Kelberg. I think I lost my witness for a second here, Your Honor. Doctor, I want to um, go back to the photographs B13 and B16 uh, regarding the blood flow that you would expect from such a stab incise wound. Are you familiar with the term called aspiration of blood? Yes. What does that mean if you'll keep your voice up, please? Aspiration means that you aspirate the blood into the uh, uh, airways or the respiratory tract. And uh, aspirated, in essence, means swallowing it instead of down the esophagus, down your windpipe? Yes, basically the blood enters the windpipe and you can't breathe. And is aspiration of blood of any significance in evaluating a sharp force injury such as the one seen in these two photographs, B13 and B16? Uh, when you have an injury of such a nature to the neck, especially size, uh, slicing the uh, thyro, uh, I mean, laryngo hyoid area, you would expect some bleeding and aspiration of blood into the uh, respiratory tract, and uh, none was found here. Uh, you have reviewed Dr. Golden's uh, report concerning an examination of the trachea and the lungs? Yes. And does he make a specific reference with respect to whether or not any such aspiration of blood was found? Uh, no. He makes no I reference? Mean, he, he makes a reference about the lungs and uh, bronchi, but he doesn't discover any aspiration. Were representative samples of the lungs preserved by Dr. Golden at the autopsy? Yes. Have you examined those preserved samples? Yes, I have. Have you examined them from the standpoint of looking for evidence of aspirated blood? Yes. What, if any, findings did you make? Uh, none. None? You made no findings? or I made findings, but there's no aspiration which I could see in the sections I examined. 
and that would be consistent with the uh, absence of a finding of aspirated blood in the uh, trachea? Yes. And in the lungs? Yes. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Now, doctor, assuming that there was no blood aspirated by Nicole Brown Simpson, what, if any, significance does that have to you in forming any opinion as to the circumstances under which this wound was inflicted and she subsequently died? As I opined yesterday, she was uh, uh, most likely face down when the final fatal stab incise wound was inflicted. Uh, and I also opined that the neck was hyperextended. And when this incision took place, all the bleeding, the blood flow went to the ground. And also, the injury you are discussing injures the, nearly all the four major blood vessels there, the, both the jugular veins and both the carotid arteries. And this would lead to sometimes uh, immediate death or death within a very short, uh, within a few minutes. And since there is bleeding there, she was definitely having uh, blood pressure for at least uh, a, a short time, which would uh, cause a death. And also, because of the position, I'm not surprised if she didn't ask me, because the blood flowed out to the ground, and there was no evidence of aspiration seen. Doctor, uh, you have had an opportunity to review photographs taken by the police department at the Bundy scene when the bodies were found, is that correct? Yes. Your Honor, I have another board of photographs that I'd ask to be, that I'd ask to be marked as Exhibit 354 entitled Blood from Sharp Force Injuries to the Neck of Ms. Brown. I'm going to. Yeah. I, let's see. Let's try that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Doctor, inviting your attention on this new exhibit, uh, 354, I believe I'd ask the court to have it marked as. I think right. 353 <coughs> was our single photograph. 354. Inviting your attention to a photograph that is marked CS11. Does that photograph have some significance to you on the subject about which you were just testifying? Yes. What is the significance? Uh, Ms. Brown Simpson is lying semi-prone here on her left side. And if you can see the left uh, forearm and hand, the knuckles are opposing the ground. Does that mean in contact with the ground? Yes. And you have the, her right hand flexed at the elbow and under her chin area, around the chin area here. This is the head here and this is the Keep your voice up, head here and the face here and then the chin is here. So this other hand is somewhere in that region. Now, if you look at uh, Crime scene photograph 39, we looked at crime scene photograph 11 now, I've given you the general uh, position. If you look at crime scene number 39, the same knuckle, if you look here, the uh, knuckle for the uh, index finger and the knuckle for the middle finger is pale and there's no uh, blood staining there. This would indicate that this hand was in contact because you'll have massive blood flow from this neck bone. And this means that this hand was in contact with the ground. This is my opinion. When this neck was hyperextended and incised. So the blood flowed around the hand and left 
the areas in contact. You can also see the watch area here and this area, which didn't have blood on it because those are the areas in contact. So the blood flows and whatever is in contact with the ground will not have any blood staining. And that supports my opinion that she was on the ground face down when this uh, fatal wound took place with the blood flowing around the uh, extremity as I just described. Doctor, which hand, CS, crime scene 39 photograph, which hand does that photograph depict? The left hand. And I ask you to assume uh, for your uh, opinion that that photograph fairly and accurately represents the condition of the hand as the body uh, was uh, observed on June 13, 1994. Okay. <clears throat> now, Doctor, I want to invite your attention. In what? This is 90. Uh, I think we have a mistake. It, uh, on the board, it says June 13, 1995. Somebody patched a five over our four. But I, I'll ask uh, Your Honor that we'll remove that patch or put another one on. It's obviously from 1994. Yes. <clears throat> Doctor, I can't quite see that. CS40, I believe, is the photograph in this same row on the opposite side. Uh, is that photograph of any significance to you? Yes. Uh, this also shows that the uh, right hand area, this is the right hand, which, I'm looking at, which we are looking at. And if you look at the area around the uh, knuckle proximal phalanx, this is the area of the hand. If you uh, read into crime scene photograph 11, it would indicate that this part of the hand is in this region here. Indicating, Your Honor, for the record, the doctor took the back of his hand, right hand and had it up against the, the chin, area. chin area on the left side a bit of his uh, chin. So this, these photographs clearly demonstrate the blood flow pattern and why uh, these photographs support my opinion, which I opined yesterday, as to the uh, neck stab slash incised wound being the last wound which Ms. Simpson suffered. Uh, uh. Doctor, in your opinion, the head can be pulled back with the left hand by use of the hair and the neck hyperextended and still have the two hands in contact with the ground as no. you've indicated here? Not only one hand in the ground. The other one was there when after the incision was made and then contact with the chin yes so one hand in contact with the ground one hand in contact with the chin when the head is pulled back is that your opinion no one hand was in contact with the ground the head was pulled back the other hand fell in place when the final resting position came in all right and so both hands were on the ground at the time the wound actually was inflicted yes now, doctor, inviting your attention to the, what appears to be blood uh, around the head of Nicole Brown Simpson in photograph CS11. Doctor, assuming that that is the blood of Nicole Brown Simpson, is that blood volume that appears in that photograph consistent with the kind of bleeding you would expect from that major stab incised wound seen in the photographs in Exhibit 352? Yes. How long would it take, in your opinion, for that blood to be um, flowing outside of the body to create what we are seeing in Crime Scene 11 photograph? Uh, as I described earlier, this is the last wound, uh, in my opinion. And I also discussed uh, loss of blood. And uh, if, if you lose about, I, I don't think I discussed that. If you lose, the normal blood volume is about 5 to 5.5 liters in an average human being. Can you give us an idea what a liter is? Uh, a liter is 1,000 cc, so f f 5 liters is about 5,000 cc. Can you and give us, hang on, before you, can we move it into a system that uh, most of us might understand? Okay. Uh, a US, gallons, a quarts? Ga it's uh, about one and a half gallons, okay. roughly. One and a half gallons is the equivalent of? The blood volume. Because normally, and this I'm talking about the US gallon, because the imperial gallon is much higher amount. I think the U.S. gallon is about 3.4 or 3.5 liters, if I'm right, and the imperial gallon is about 4.4. So, Doctor, I didn't even know there was an imperial gallon. Imperial so gallon I'll, is in the I'll be satisfied way. with the U.S. gallon. Yeah. So it's about one and a half gallons of uh, blood uh, volume, and just an approximation. The normal blood volume, as I know, in the metric system is 5.5 to 5.5 liters. If anybody loses 2 to 2.5 liters rapidly, they will go into shock. 
and following shock, you, you more or less will die after that because without medical treatment, because your heart will go into irregular beats and then you'll die. Ms. Brown had other injuries, which also would cause significant bleeding. She had four sharp force injuries to the neck here. She had some sharp force injuries to the head, which would also cause, cause bleeding. And those, in my opinion, occurred before this war. So accounting for some blood loss from those wounds and this, I would say she died within a few minutes, probably much less than a minute also, because uh, the should have gone into rapid shock with this massive injury. And doctor, is that time frame, minutes to perhaps less than a minute, sufficient for that volume of blood to flow outside of her body? Yes, because as I told you, uh, these are large vessels in the neck, the carotid arteries. The, the carotid artery roughly pumps about 200 cc a minute on both sides, and you also have the jugular veins, which are large, large venous channels. There'll be a lot of being, plus also all the smaller vessels are getting cut at the same time. I'm not discussing the smaller vessels. When you say smaller vessels, smaller blood vessels? Yes, which are branches of these vessels. And what will be the effect of having those uh, injured? All will be bleeding till the blood pressure goes to zero. And you blood pressure goes to zero uh, when you lose about 25% uh, or 30% of your blood volume. Doctor, when you testified yesterday uh, about this stab incised wound, you talked about, uh, in your opinion, how it is deeper on the left side and shallower on the right side. Was there also something about the angulation of the wound which was of any significance to you? Yes, uh, it angulates uh, from the mid portion of the left neck upwards to the right side of the neck below the ear. The wound ends just below the right ear. How is the angulation of any significance to you, if it is, in forming your opinion as to the sequence or con uh, circumstances of how the wound was in fact inflicted as shown in the demonstration yesterday afternoon? That will uh, support uh, my opinion in the manner that when the head is hyperextended and a right-handed person inflicts this injury, uh, at least a person used his right hand to inflict this injury, uh, the, uh, the upward angle will fit the scenario which I just uh, opined. Now, Doctor, you said a right-handed person, and then you talked about a person using his right hand. How do you distinguish those two concepts? Because uh, some people may be strong in both the hands, and some people are uh, so there could be equal dexterity in both the extremities. Equal dexterity in both extremities? Yes. Uh, and extremities meaning, in this case, the hands? Yes. And if you try to keep your voice up, it would really help the reporter because she's behind you and it's, it's very difficult, so. Doctor, uh, before uh, I move to another photograph uh, that uh, you briefly talked about, B18, I just want to talk briefly about an area on B13 uh, that appears on the left side of the face of Nicole Brown Simpson uh, and what appears to be some kind of discoloration. Do you see that in the photograph? Yes. Is that of any significance to you as a forensic pathologist? Yes, that is uh, the discoloration caused by postmortem lividity, which is also known as liver mortis. And we touched on that, I think, on. Friday when we were looking at those forms that Claudine Radcliffe filled out. Can you point out the area first of all in the photograph? This uh, area here and this mottled area here. I know the court can't see it. Uh, my representation would be that the doctor pointed to the area just above the left side of the chin and also would you point again doctor to the other? Uh, the the below the, uh, the left cheek area. And the left cheek area of the photograph B18. 
Court's familiar with the photograph. I'm sorry, B13. Court's familiar with the photograph. Uh, and again, we're going to get into a much more detailed discussion of lividity, but for our purposes here, Doctor, what is it and how does it have significance, if any, to you? Yeah. Lividity is the uh, draining of blood after, after the circulation has ceased to the dependent parts of the body by the action of gravity causing discoloration in areas which are not under pressure. Uh, so L let me, if I could, could I have our Exhibit 354 board? If you just slide it this way. For, no, I don't. Thank you, Doug. Because you've used some terms, dependent part of the body and so forth. Can you use photograph CS11 yes. to demonstrate what you're talking about, dependent part of the body? Yes. In CS11, you see the left side of the face of Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson is the most dependent part of the body, touching the ground, and uh, uh, almost touching the ground except for that interspersed right hand I discussed earlier. Uh, uh, so the discoloration which I showed you in B13 is the draining of blood to that area. Because of this position, she uh, ultimately, ultimately uh, came to rest after death. And Doctor, when you're talking about the dependent part of the body, in essence, are you saying the lowest part of the body? In that position, yes. For and obviously, that can change depending on the position of the body. Yes. But in this particular photograph, CS11, with respect to the face, the dependent part of the face is which side? The left side of the face. And then is <coughs> the appearance of lividity that you've identified in B13 consistent with what you would expect to see from a body that had been in that position? Yes. Doctor, is there anything, um, oh, I, I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned on B16, uh, I think the thyroid area, is that correct? Yes. And in your testimony, as I recall, you used the term uh, cornu, C-O-R-N-U, is that correct? Yes. Uh, is that area shown in some fashion in uh, photograph yeah, I can, B16? It's uh, approximately shown here in the right side here. This is the thyroid cartilage I'm pointing to in B16. And the cornu, C-O-R-N-U, are also known uh, as horns, H-O-R-N-S, thyroid horns, they are situated at the back of the upper part of the thyroid cartilage on both sides. And this right cornu was also incised by the same wound as it was traversing from left to right. Incidentally, doctor, um, this wound in B16 is in a gaping state, is that correct? Yes. You talked about lines of Langer, or Langer's lines. Do those lines come into play in this issue of the gaping state? No, in this situation, the neck has almost been sliced half from front to back. So it's more than this line of Langer. All the structures here have been cut so that the wound, the neck is not as stable as it should be because the spine has also been cut. So you have, uh, uh, and also the positioning of the, uh, the uh, body when you, when, you, when, you, when you take a photograph Keep your voice up. When you take a photograph from a front view, because of the gaping wound, you see more gaping. Now, doctor, did you find that in Dr. Golden's original protocol, he described this major stab incise wound that we have uh, seen in the photographs B13, B16, and a small portion in B18? Yes. Did Dr. Golden also diagram in one or more of the forms that uh, you've previously identified uh, that same injury? Yes, he has. Did he, in his original protocol or his original diagrams, uh, identify the injury to the right cornu? Uh, no, he did not. Is that a mistake for him not to have addressed that in his protocol? It is a mistake. Is it a mistake of his not to have diagrammed that in one or more of the diagram forms available? It is a mistake. And doctor, have you considered those mistakes, those are two mistakes then, is that correct? Yes. Have you considered those mistakes as to their significance on all these issues you've uh, been asked about? Yes, I have. 
in your opinion, does that mistake of failing to identify it in the protocol and the mistake of failing to diagram it have any significance on any of the issues that you've addressed? No. Why not? Because that's a, a, a injury in a massive injury to the neck and most importantly, the neck organs was saved and it's available for review and that's how I saw it. And uh, to me, it has no significance as far as the cause of death goes or in explaining what I just explained regarding aspiration and other, fat, other issues. And it's a mistake, but it's not of significance for any of the issues as far as the cause of death, <coughs> bleeding patterns, uh, and uh, <coughs> evaluating the injury. Does it have any significance in your ability to assess the class of knife or classes of knives which could be responsible for inflicting that major stab incised wound? No, because the, uh, the corner has been incised, so it could be both a single edge or a double edge knife. Anything with a sharp edge could have caused that, uh, uh, that transaction of the corner. So this is one of the sharp force injuries that you are not able to distinguish by the appearance of the injury itself, whether it's a single edge or a double edge? That is correct. But it is a sharp force injury that is consistent with a six inch long single edge knife blade? Yes, and I, but I would favor it being a single edge because there's one area which, uh, if you look at B18, the wound started as an incised wound, but then there's a bridge here following that, which I would favor a single edge knife, but uh, because a double edge knife would have would not leave a bridge there. Because a single edge knife, when you, when you start using the sharp portion of the knife to make the cut, and then you do the penetrating part, the blunt edge will leave a bridge there. And that is why this photograph is important, that this wound, even though I can't say hunt, uh, with full certainty that it is only a single edge knife, I would favor a single edge knife, uh, but a double edge knife could do a, can create a wound of similar nature. Dodger, just for the record. And uh, you can see the bridge better. You use a magnifying glass. See the bridge I think you may be able to see it with a magnifying glass, but uh, I'm afraid I think the jurors probably can't see it from where they're seated. But for the record, Doctor, you were pointing to an area on B18 that is, that is to uh, it's the left side of the neck area, and it is to the area that is immediately adjacent to where there appears to be that uh, side of this major stab incised wound. Is that correct? Yes. It's Yes. Doctor, is there anything else uh, of significance to you with respect to these three photographs with particularity on this stab incised wound that we have not discussed? Mm. No. Before we move to the uh, more detailed description of the other stab wounds, I think I have just a moment to set up the uh, easels and maybe ask all counsel to help us out a bit to give us a little room. Given our problems here, if council want to step into the well, they're welcome to do so. The protocol. Excuse me, Mr. Lynch, I think you're blocking juror number seven's view. Perhaps Mr. Lynch can come over here. All right, let me just check. 165, can you see these items? And Dr. Washman, you may be blocking. All right, thank you. Doctor, this is the uh, blow-up of the actual original protocol, is that correct? Yes. What page or pages in this protocol reflects Dr. Golden's identification of this major stab incised wound? I think it's page... Uh, Three and four. And I'm going to ask Mr. Lynch to turn to page three if you need some help. Doctor, uh, on this page, where, if at all, do you see uh, the start of any description regarding that injury? Uh, it's page three, in the bottom of the page it says description of incised wound of neck and the evidence of injury 
and then it starts uh, the description of the wound and then continues to page four. All right, before we flip to page four, Your Honor, for the record, I'm going to mark B, 13, 16, 18, along the left margin of page three by the description where Dr. Lakshmanan has identified. And now if we could continue on. Page four continues the description of what all I just discussed. It also discusses the injury to the carotid artery, the jugular vein, and what I'd like to point out is the description of the right jugular vein where there's only a quarter inch cut, whereas the internal jugular vein on the left side is almost transected, which again would support my opinion that the left side was a deeper part of the wound compared to the right side, which is shallow. Doctor, and does this entire page cover aspects of the description and opinion from Dr. Golden regarding that same injury? Yes. So, Your Honor, may I uh, also mark similarly along the left side, B13, B16, B18 of that uh, series. Now, Doctor, um, we have to the left of Mr. Lynch, a blow up of another one of the exhibits from 349 and its uh, smaller version in the 348 series. Is this one of the diagrams that was used by Dr. Golden with respect to drawing in observations made during the course of the autopsy? Yes. Does this diagram contain any reference to this stab incised wound that we've been discussing over the last few minutes? Yes. Would you uh, step perhaps to the shows the uh, wound in the left neck going up from the midpoint of the left neck up to the uh, low, lower right ear. It's, it's, a diagram it's a diagrammatic representation. And doctor, does there appear to be any description or writing made by Dr. Golden reflecting his observations of that wound? Yes. Uh, this particular handwriting here refers to this wound and it's a, you can also see it starts with the edges smooth and then <coughs> continues up to here. When uh, you see the words edges smooth, is that consistent with your examination of the margins, pardon me, the margins of that stab incised wound? Yes. And the significance of the edges being smooth? I discussed it that it's a single cut and in my opinion there was not any resistance offered. By Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. Your Honor, where uh, Dr. Golden has, I'm uh, sorry, Dr. Lakshmanan has testified regarding the entries by Dr. Golden on this form. May the record reflect I have encircled the area in red and on the uh, big diagram form 22, and I'm writing out at the edge B13, B16, B18. Yes. Now, Dr. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Lynch, if he would, to take down 22 and put up another and it form. By the way, that was on board 3B, and I can't tell the number. I think that's 0B, the protocol, the original protocol, but I, I'll verify that when we get it down. It's on the other side. 0B, Mr. Lynch confirms. Uh, <coughs> Doctor, uh, this is a Form 20 is, uh, that's used by Dr. Golden in the course of the autopsy? Yes. And is there an entry by Dr. Golden on this form with respect to that same neck injury? Yes. You can see it on the neck going from the left side of the mid part of the neck to the upper right neck below the ear. And is there any writing that you attribute from Dr. Golden to that particular injury? <coughs> yes. It says trans here. That means transverse and then up, going up here, this part here. And Your Honor, where Dr. Lakshmanan has testified regarding the diagram by Dr. Golden on Form 20, I'm circling it in red and out at the side writing B13, B16, B18. Now I'm going to ask Mr. Lynch to put up a copy of the addendum report. I'm sorry, actually, before he does so, if I may have just a moment to get a different diagram. I'm going to ask that this board, uh, which is 6B, be put up. By the way, 20 was 2B. 
Doctor, there's a Form 24, is that correct? Yes. Is this another one of the forms used by Dr. Golden in the course of the autopsy? Yes. And is there any entry or markings on this form that reflect upon the same injury we've been discussing? Yes, uh, he has uh, shown the injury to the thyroid area here and has given his description. So this and this whole area and the, this whole area would reflect the injury of the internal description of the injury to the neck which I just uh, opined on. Now doctor, does this form depict in a diagrammatic fashion the cornu or horn area that you talked about uh, earlier this morning? Yes, uh, because there's a lot of writing here, I've used this part. This is the thyroid cartilage, uh, the, the, the side view. This is the cornu area of the thyroid cartilage. And you can see it here too, but only with the lines there, it's very difficult to see. But you can see it on both sides. This is the thyroid cornu cartilage. All right, doctor, if you could say for just a moment, if I write in thyroid cartilage, And would you point out again the horns? Uh, starting down here, please. All right, I'll circle that area. And where is it on the other side, Doctor? I'll circle that area and draw lines and write the word horns. And in this picture, you can see them here, the front view. And in that area, Doctor, I'll circle in red and write horns to represent what you've identified. And all of the writing in this upper right quadrant of yes, form 24? Yes, and also this side, because uh, this is the description of the thyroid area. But here he describes the left common carotid artery transector, left LIJV is left internal jugular vein, subtotal transection, thin strand, which is the posterior portal of the portion of the vein, which is left there. And on the right side, he says, right internal jugular vein only nick, right common carotid artery transected. So this all would belong to this injury we described. All right, and doctor, subtotal is a fancy way of saying what? Subtotal transection. Uh, almost uh, transected with only a small bridge of the vein wall left in the back. And your honor, where the doctor has indicated there has been an entry by Dr. Golden on this diagram. I've uh, encircled it uh, with a red pen. And again, I'll write in the upper left hand corner B13, B16, B18. By the way, Doctor, uh, there's a stamp that appears in the upper right corner of that diagram. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, how does that stamp come to be on these forms? We have a blue card just like your credit card. We make a credit card for uh, every resident we have in our office and you just take the card and you imprint any form or diagram you want to use. So you have the number, the name, and you can see we also have the crypt number that we discussed yesterday. That's what I was going to... Number four. All right, so if I circle this number four and I'll write in crypt, number on the diagram that is what her crip number was as a sign yes okay any other entries on this particular diagram no oh incidentally doctor is it with respect to either the right upper quadrant or the right lower quadrant of this diagram that you would have expected Dr. Golden to have made a entry regarding the cornu. Well, he has drawn a number of lines in the thyroid area, uh, but he has not specifically addressed that the right cornu was incised. Is that where you would have expected him to do so in the upper right quadrant uh, diagram? Yes. Six B, Your Honor, twenty four. Mr. Lynch, you have 
Lynch is now putting up is now putting up our uh, blow up of the addendum report. Is that correct, Doctor? This yes. is the addendum report, the final addendum report? Yes. Is there a page or pages of the addendum report which address the uh, Cornu injury? Yes, page two, number two. All right, we'll ask uh, Mr. Lynch if he could. Where you just pointed with the pointer, this is the entry by Dr. Golden to reflect the injury that you observed in the right corner? Yes. And I think that's pretty self-explanatory, Your Honor. All I did was circle the area, uh, item <coughs> 2 on page 2, and I'll write B13, B16, B18. Now, Dr. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Lynch to get that down. I think we're done with this for the moment. That board was 8B. Kelberg will be going to 10:30 this morning. Thank you, Your Doctor, let me uh, invite your attention now specifically to the photo on Exhibit 352. I think Council may want to move back. I think we're done with the two easels down there. Uh, B18, and now with respect to these uh, four stab wounds that you identified earlier um, and briefly. Have they been given arbitrary numbers? Yes. And by arbitrary, what do you mean? That is, the, they were just given numbers for convenience. They do not, in, uh, do not uh, <coughs> reflect sequence of infliction. So if you have an, a wound that's injury number one, or stab wound number one, it doesn't mean that that was the first stab wound that was inflicted. Is that accurate? That is correct. And in this photograph, how many stab wounds do you see to the left side of the neck of Nicole Brown Simpson? There are four. One two, three, and four, and three of them are really stab wounds. One of them is a superficial sharp force injury there. And when you say superficial sharp force injury, uh, in defining, as you did yesterday, incised wounds as uh, being uh, longer than they are deep, and stab wounds as being deeper than they are long, how would you define this one? Well, it could be the tip of the knife barely penetrating the upper part of the skin and soft tissue, or it could be a nick from the knife. It's difficult to uh, specify on it because it's a very superficial wound. Uh, there's no depth uh, which was uh, available to analyze it. Let's start with uh, uh, a kind of a collective question. Injuries one, three, and four. From your examination of the appearance of those wounds in this photograph, do you have an opinion as to the class or classes of knives which could inflict each of those wounds? I, my opinion is that they were all three caused by a single edge knife, and uh, that is, each of the wounds have a blunt end and a sharp end. Can even you though start with injury number one and just use the pointer. I don't think we're going to be able, to, at some point perhaps the jury will have a magnifying glass and an opportunity to look for that. But if you'll start by just pointing which is the blunt end and which is the sharp end of each. Injury number one, you can see the blunt end in the lower part and the sharp end in the upper end. All right, so as we look at the photograph, the blunt end is going to be towards the bottom of the photo? Yes. And the sharp end is going to be towards the top? Yes. All right. How about injury number three? The sharp end is in the 
posterior part and the blunt end is in the front. So when you say posterior, for our purposes, is that to the right side of the photograph? That is correct. And the sharp end is to the left side? Yes. And how about injury number four? The blunt end is to the left side of the photograph, sharp end is to the right side of the photograph. What about injury number two? Are you able to form an opinion as to the class or classes of knives which could have created that sharp force injury? Injury number two, I can't tell. It could be either a single edge or a double edge. But in your opinion, could all four of these stab wounds then have been caused by the same single edge knife blade? Absolutely. And as you described, one that was six inches long? Yes, because as we discussed yesterday, these stab wounds, if you read the description, only have a depth of one and a half to two inches. So you don't have to necessarily have the entire knife penetrate in this area. So you could have a six inch knife with a tapering blade, which could have caused these injuries. Doctor, does Dr. Golden describe each of these four stab wounds in his original protocol? Yes, he does. Does he diagram each of these four stab wounds in one or more diagrams? Yes, he does. Now, doctor, given the area where these stab wounds were received, and given the nature of the major stab incise wound that you have described earlier in the three photographs, 13, 16, and 18, can you determine, as a forensic pathologist, whether, for example, starting with stab wound number one, that stab wound actually punctured or struck in any way either the jugular vein on the left side or the carotid artery on the left side? Uh, Dr. Golden's description is that they may have injured these vessels, but because of the massive near transection of the jugular vein on the left side and complete transection of the carotid artery on the left side, he could not see uh, uh, whether there was injury from these four, these three wounds which I discussed, because in their depth, the region of the injury which they would have caused by their track in the body was the same area which had already been uh, uh, injured by the major incise slash stab wound. And when you say already, you've testified your opinion was that the major stab incise wound came last, is that correct? Yes. And if in fact that is what occurred, and these four stab wounds were already inflicted, would that last stab wound, in essence, create damage over whatever damage to the jugular and or carotid had been inflicted by one or more of the four stab wounds? That is the uh, op opinion which was given in the report, which indicates that the injury, the massive injury to the carotid artery and jugular vein on the left side precluded him from evaluating injuries on from these stab wounds. Uh, Doctor, in your opinion, could Dr. Golden have made a more complete or detailed evaluation through dissection of the area to see if there was a way to state with greater certainty whether either the carotid or jugular was actually nicked or hit by any one of those three stab wounds or four stab wounds? The, uh, there could have been a little more dissection of the, the carotid vessels on either side of the transection because the vein is difficult to dissect because it will fall apart. It's a very thin walled structure. But the carotid artery could have been opened on both sides of the transection to see whether there are any additional nicks. And uh, the report doesn't reflect whether that was done or not, but definitely uh, uh, it doesn't indicate that there was additional cuts. Doctor. If that had been done, would it necessarily have allowed Dr. Golden to see whether any one of those stab wounds did in fact hit the jugular and or carotid? Uh, if he had done the dissection, he could have said that he did the dissection and he didn't see it, which would support his original opinion wherein he had indicated that he could not evaluate the injury to these structures because of the massive injury caused by the fatal stab wound, which was inflicted last. Doctor, assuming that Dr. Golden failed to do the kind of dissection, more detailed dissection that you've indicated, would that be a mistake, in your opinion, in the manner in which he conducted the autopsy? Uh, if he had not done the dissection, 
it would be a mistake. But if you have done the dissection and not recorded it, it would not be a mistake. I'm sorry, not recorded it? I mean, if it's, when, when is it, if his evaluation included that he had done the dissection, but he had not stated as such, then it would not be a mistake. But if he didn't do the dissection, it would be a mistake? I would do the dissection to see whether there's additional injuries there. Doctor, if Dr. Golden did not do the dissection, in your opinion, would such a failure have any significance to you on any of the issues that you've been talking about? No. Including on whether a single, single-edged knife could have caused all of these sharp force injuries? That is correct. Why would that have no significance? Because we can, the opinion on the nature of the sharp force instrument can be made from the wound patterns on the skin. The bleeding patterns have been uh, described uh, from the vascular injuries, which I already uh, discussed. So really, it won't have a significant as to the cause of death or the manner of death or the uh, bleeding blood flow patterns. Doctor, uh, if I could have the board, not the pointer, I'm sorry, the, the board that has been marked as 354. Let's, this is the one of the crime scene photographs. Assume for the sake of argument that stab wound number one did not strike either the left carotid artery or the left jugular vein. Would that stab wound nevertheless have caused some bleeding? Yes, it would have. It's a highly vascular area of the neck. I'm sorry, a Very highly vascular area of the neck. And when you say highly vascular, what does that mean in lay terms? The neck is, has got a lot of branches from the arteries and you also have a lot of venous channels. And a wound to this area of the neck, which is one and a half to two inches deep, would cause significant bleeding. And if, in fact, either the jugular or the carotid or both had been hit, what kind of bleeding over and above bleeding without such a nick would you expect? There would be more bleeding. Now, doctor, is there a difference between the stab wound, what it can do to the carotid or jugular, and the incised stab wound that you uh, identified as transecting? The if, if it just punctures the carotid artery, you'll have spurting of blood. But transection also, you can have spurting, but you'll have more uh, bleeding because the whole vessel has been transected. And also, the person would uh, lose blood pressure much faster and die earlier than the transection than just from a puncture. So the survivability for a puncture wound would be longer than a transection. Doctor, let me invite your attention to another photograph from uh, our Exhibit 354 that's marked CS12. And again, I'll ask you to assume that uh, this photograph is a fair and accurate representation of the position and condition surrounding Nicole Brown Simpson as her body was found on June 13, 1994. And now I want to invite your attention specifically to a step that appears uh, immediately above her body in that photograph. Do you see that, doctor? Yes. And do you see what appears to be blood uh, surrounding that, or part of the area of that step? Yes, I see that. In looking at the quantity of blood, assuming it is the blood of Nicole Brown Simpson, is that um, amount of blood seen there consistent with what you would expect from the four stab wounds that we're looking at on B18? Yes. Why is that, doctor? Because, as I told you, the area of the neck is quite vascular, and whether they struck the jugular vein or carotid artery or they did not, still combined, they would cause significant bleeding, which could account for this blood here if the uh, Ms. Simpson's uh, upper portion of the body had been in contact with that area. After the wound had been, wound or wounds had been inflicted? Yes. Does the court wish to take a break at this point? Yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, take our regular recess at this time. Please remember all my admonitions to you. Do not discuss the case amongst yourselves. Do not form any opinions about the case. Do not conduct any deliberations till the matter has been submitted to you. Do not allow anybody to contact or communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll stand in recess for 15 minutes.
Let the record reflect where we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Dr. Lakshmanan is still on the witness stand undergoing direct examination by Mr. Kelberg. And Mr. Kelberg, you may continue with your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. And again, with the court's permission, could Dr. Lakshmanan step down? We'll put the photographic board and maybe all counsel and Drs. Bodden and Wolf will wish to And which board are you putting up, Mr. Kelberg? I'm sorry? Which board are you putting up? 352 again, Your Honor. All right. Doctor, I'd like to now go into a more detailed uh, description from you of stab wound number one and then go through the series of the four stab wounds. Uh, stab wound number one is... Uh, Keep your voice up again, please. Stab wound one, number one is located in the left neck and it measures 7 sixteenths of an inch by 1 eighth of an inch in the photographic measurement I did. And 7 sixteenths of an inch is what direction, doctor? Will you show us with the pointer? In a sup superior inferior direction. That's more or less up and down? Yes. And 3 16th inch uh, in the transverse uh, or anteroposterior axis as I'm pointing here. Side to side? Yes. All right. So this is the uh, wound when I measured it in the state I could see it in the photograph, in the one is to one photograph which I had. The life size photograph? Yes. The uh, Wound in Dr. Golden's measurement is 5 eighths inch in uh, uh, length in his description. Uh, the blunt end, as I mentioned earlier, is, the, is in the inferior part, and the sharp end is in the upper part of the wound. And uh, this wound uh, penetrated the left side of the neck in a left to right direction and was up to 2 inches in depth. Doctor, from the information in Dr. Golden's protocol and your evaluation of the life-size <coughs> photograph, can you tell us anything about the relative positions of the perpetrator and Nicole Brown Simpson at the time stab wound number one was inflicted? Uh, could you expand on your question? Uh, want to give more information? Uh, yes. And, uh, doctor, for example, can you say, when I say relative positions, um, can you say whether the two were relatively speaking face to face, one was behind the other? Can you give us any additional information from that uh, stab wound number one? Uh, it could be a situation where they were facing each other and the uh, assailant had a weapon in the right hand and that wound could have been inflicted in that manner. Can you use me? I'll step over back here again. Can you use me uh, as Nicole Brown Simpson just to show, relatively speaking, incidentally, when you use the term and I use the term relative position, does that have meaning to you as a forensic pathologist? Uh, it just means the positions in which these uh, wounds could have been inflicted uh, by the medical findings one has. All right. Can you use me as Nicole Brown Simpson and indicate how, in your opinion, the uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and the perpetrator <coughs> could have been face to face and have the stab wound number one inflicted with a right-handed uh, held knife? Uh, in this manner. And Your Honor, for the record, Dr. Lakshmanan with his right hand uh, clenched fist uh, representing holding a knife has raised his arm uh, above my left shoulder and has it angled at about a 45 degree angle towards my neck. All right, why don't you trade places so that the jurors can actually see the right arm. All right, doctor, let's ask you to do that again. And the, the knife in question does is a single edge knife and the blunt edge would be on the lower part and, and the sharp edge would be in the upper part of the uh, corresponding to the wound. And is that consistent with what you see, in fact, in stab wound number one? Yes. 
Now, Doctor, are there other relative positions that could account for that? Uh, there could be other questions, too. And is there any way for you as a forensic pathologist to be able to say with specificity what was the actual relative position? No. Is there any way, given that you cannot say with specificity the relative positions, that you can say whether the knife was being held by the right hand or the left hand of the perpetrator? I cannot say that. I cannot say which hand. And does the hand depend on what the actual, I'll tell you what, I'm sorry. does the hand that has the knife then um, depend, a finding, depend on the relative positions at the time the wound was inflicted? That is correct. Now can you do basically the same uh, identification process for stab wound number two, or I'm sorry, sharp force injury number two? Uh, sharp force injury number two, I'm pointing to it right now, it's one eighth inch, it's superficial, it's a superficial, <coughs> superficial puncture of incised wound. Doctor, in your opinion, would that uh, superficial incised wound create any extensive bleeding? Uh, no. Incidentally, stab wound number one, if it did in fact um, strike either the left jugular vein or the left carotid artery, would that wound, in your opinion, be fatal if there was no medical intervention? It could be potentially a serious wound if the carotid artery and jugular vein was injured. My question is, would it, in your opinion, be a fatal wound if, in fact, uh, Nicole Brown Simpson did not receive immediate and appropriate medical care? If she did not receive uh, immediate and appropriate medical care, it would be potentially serious fatal wound. Well, I would assume a fatal wound is a serious wound. In your opinion, is it a fatal wound? Yes. Now, doctor, in fact, if there had been such uh, a striking of the jugular or and or carotid, could that wound be fatal even with immediate and proper medical intervention? It could be fatal. Now, stab, or, I'm sorry, sharp force injury number two, uh, in your opinion, is that a non-fatal injury? Yes. And um, other than being uh, a superficial incise wound, does it have any significant uh, bearing on the cause of death of Nicole Brown Simpson? No. Is there anything else about, um, I'm sorry, can you tell anything about the relative position of Nicole Brown Simpson and the perpetrator from the appearance of that sharp force injury number two? The same statements I applied to the stab wound number one would apply to this. So in the relative positions of face-to-face -face that you showed, is that a possibility? That is a possibility, and uh, it could also be the person who had the weapon in the left hand and was in the back, that same kind of wound could have been inflicted from a left to right direction. And if it was face-to-face, -face, again, it would be a knife held in the right hand? Yes. Now, uh, stab wound number three uh, in the photograph, B18, a description of that, please. Uh, this stab wound is uh, uh, transversely oriented, that is side-to-side uh, -side in this photograph. Uh, in contrast to the other wound, which is uh, more in a vertical orientation. So this is more in a horizontal orientation. It's got a blunt end in the front and a sharp end in the back. And this wound measured 5 16 inch by 3 16 inch in the state of the photograph I reviewed, the one is to one photograph. And doctor, from your review of the life-size photograph, uh, is your measurement consistent with any measurement made by Dr. Golden, given limitations of measurements from photographs that you described yesterday? Uh, there's no significant uh, uh, difference if you take the limitations of the process into consideration. And those limitations were? I discussed them yesterday. The photograph I'm viewing is a two-dimensional photograph. It's a slightly <coughs> gaping wound. Uh, got Dr. Golden approximated the wounds when he did the measurement. And when you approximate, you know the wound can be longer uh, because he measured it as a half an inch long wound. And uh, this, uh, and I also indicated that the other problem when you do photographic measurement is that when you have a curvature like this, the neck is a curved area of the body, your measurement of the photograph doesn't take into consideration the curvature component which you would do in a real life situation when you're measuring the wound in an approximated state. So given those limitations, his measurements are uh, not significantly different from mine. 
Now, Doctor, is, in your opinion, stab wound number three a potentially fatal stab wound if, in fact, it struck either the carotid or the jugular? Yes. And the same would apply if it struck both, I assume? Yes. If it did not strike either, would it be a fatal stab wound? No. Would it still be a stab wound that would produce significant bleeding? Yes. How about stab wound number four? Can you give us some more detailed information? Stab wound number four uh, is the lowermost wound. It also has the same horizontal orientation. It's got a sharp end in the uh, right side of the photograph and a blunt end in the front of the photograph. And this wound in its uh, gaping state measured 9 16th inch by uh, 3 eighths of an inch, the 9 16th inch being the horizontal component and 3 8 inch being the vertical component. And Dr. Golden measured this wound in his original report as 7 8 inch in the approximated state. And given the limitations of the process, I saw no significant difference uh, attributable to my measurements. And uh, this wound. Uh, also had a track in the body about one and a half <coughs> inches. Now, Doctor, I don't think I asked you on, on stab wound number three about relative positions. Would your answers be the same as to relative positions of Nicole Brown Simpson and the perpetrator and the right-handed or left-handed nature of the knife being held as they were for stab wounds one and two? Yes. All right. Now, stab wound number four, <coughs> excuse me, if that ha stab wound had, in fact, uh, hit in any fashion, either the jugular or the carotid, would that stab wound be a fatal stab wound? Yes. And if it hit both, also a fatal stab wound? Yes. And if it hit neither, a non-fatal stab wound? Yes. Would it still be a stab wound which would produce significant bleeding if it struck neither the carotid or the jugular? Yes. Would your aunt, I'm sorry, did you want to add something? No. Would your answers about relative positions of the perpetrator and Nicole Brown Simpson and the right-handed and left-handed nature of holding the knife be the same for stab wound number four as they have been for stab wounds one, two, and three? Yes. Doctor, is there any significance to you as a forensic pathologist that these four stab wounds appear to have a, a linear relationship uh, if one goes from the stab wound number one to sharp force injury number two to stab wound number three to stab wound number four. Yes, it does have a significance because they're all localized to one area of the neck, which would signify that there was some uh, limitation of movement created, at least to the neck area, when these wounds were inflicted by the assailant because uh, they are localized to one area that may more or less in the same area, and there's some movement because some wound, one wound is not as deep as the other, but still it would signify some partial immobilization at least because given the localized area of all these four stab wounds in that area. When you say immobilization, immobilization of who or what? Ms. Brown Simpson by the assailant. And immobilization is a long word to mean in essence what? Uh, prevent uh, uh, movement of the person by uh, uh, holding them or uh, 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 holding them against a wall or just holding them tight so that you have some control over them that they cannot exert the same degree of movements as you would expect in a person who is uh, not so uh, compromised. If a person were not so compromised, would you expect that person to try to avoid being struck by the knife? Yes. Objection, cause for speculation. Oh. And your answer, doctor, is? Yes. Now, doctor, uh, is there anything else with respect to a description of these four shark force injuries along the neck as seen in photograph B18 you wish to bring out? Okay. If we could move, then we're going to go back to the protocols and the diagrams. At that position, we're putting zero B up. And we're putting
putting, uh, which is the protocol, and we're putting 3B up, which is our form, I believe, 22. Now, Doctor, uh, did Dr. Golden address each of these four sharp force injuries that we've been looking at in B18 in his original autopsy report? Yes, he has. Where? Uh, in uh, page uh, five and six of the report. If Mr. Lynch can turn to page five of the protocol blow up. Doctor, where does that uh, start? Uh, one, two, three, and four is the same numbers which I used when I described photograph B18, I believe. B18, yes. So right. it follows the same format. All right, Your Honor, then on page five of the protocol in the upper left-hand corner, under description of multiple stab wounds, I'm writing B18. Um, I'll leave it at that. And you said uh, it continues on to page f uh, six, is it, Doctor? Yes, number four, stab wound, the 7-8 inch wound, which I discussed last, continues to page six. If Mr. Lynch could flip that, please. Just the first two paragraphs. Would it be accurate, Doctor, that the description on B18 ends where I bet the red marker here? Yes. And so, Your Honor, uh, with that red marker, I'm making a U-shaped box, if you will, around those two paragraphs on page six and writing B18 within the margin. Thank you. Doctor, did Dr. Golden diagram in any fashion on any of the diagrams those four sharp force injuries? Yes, it did. Uh, is it seen in diagram 22? Yes. Would you show us, please, where? Yes, I will. And keep your voice up, please, doctor. The four stab wounds are tied on the, on the left side of the neck, in the lower right quadrant of this uh, board, one, three, four, and two is two. And you have the description of all the wounds in this uh, Well, let's start, first of all, where do you see the description for the four stab wounds? One description is here, and then you have two, and then you have a stab wound number three here, and four here. All right, so the whole thing is the description for all the four stab wounds. So basically, it's the lower half of form 22, which has been used by Dr. Golden, yes. to identify and describe those four sharp four yes. injuries. And to repeat, this is number one. All right. says, but you stop, let me just mark that. Which is number one, doctor? All right, I'm gonna put a box around that on the diagram and write in SW number one. Yeah, and actually this includes also because it says uh, uh, it's three inches below the EAC, uh, uh, EAC, which is the external auditory canal. From here, it is three inches below that here. So that should be good for this group. All right, I'll raise the encircled area on the lower right hand side of the diagram to include that. And, I'm sorry, can you also? Number two is this one eighteen superficial puncture here, which is alluded here. So this is number two. Alright, in, in that area, doctor, I'm going to circle where you've just been pointing and write SW, actually SF for sharp force, number two. All right, how about number three? Number three is here, and the orientation is given here, and this is happening, and this is the All right, would it be accurate to say, doctor, that the area I'm circling now in the form diagram in the right lower quadrant is the area of the diagram of sharp force injuries one, three, and four? Yes. All right, and so you're, I'm gonna mark um, SW number one, SW number three, SW number four, and then the area that you circled or the pointer outline in the lower left quadrant of form 22, I'm circling and I'll write in 
Uh, this is SW number three. Is that correct, Adam? All right. Now, where is the description with respect to the fourth one? Here. And I'll circle that area and write SW number four. Doctor, can you uh, identify the content of Dr. Golden's description there for us? Yeah, this is, uh, he described this as a 7 8 inch wound, 132 inch blunt end in the front, sharp end in the back, 1 to 1 and a half inches deep. And if you look at the description here, it is the same here, 1 to 1 and a half inches before. And here was a reference to page 6 of uh, the autopsy form uh, number 12. Doctor, anything further with respect to identification on these four sharp force injuries on diagram 22? No. And uh, for this diagram, that's it. Was any other diagram used by Dr. Golden regarding no. these? No. Was there any reference to these four sharp force injuries in Dr. Golden's addendum? Uh, no. Was there any need from your perspective for any reference in the addendum? No. While we're in this position, let me cover just a couple of, <coughs> pardon me, brief points, if we could. All right, you put up one B. Thank you, Your Honor. You've got a position to see that. And this is uh, a blow-up, Doctor, is it not, of the Form 15 document? Yes. Now, in the uh, upper part of that document, there is a date and time listed. Do you see that? Yes. And that time is to reflect what? Usually the, that's the time the autopsy started. And the class A is checked? Yes. And that's uh, what you indicated is the fullest type of autopsy performed in your office. Is that correct? Yes. You also testified yesterday, I believe, regarding a mix-up in identification of a specimen between urine and bile. Is that correct? Yes. Does this form show that front page uh, that was completed? Not, it is not on, it's not on Ms. Simpson's 15. It is on Mr. 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 Goldman. Yeah, but the form doesn't reflect the mistake. The form is correctly marked as bile in Mr. Goldman. What was marked wrongly was the bottle. See, the bottle has spaces. <coughs> the wrong box was marked off in the bottle, so not on the 15. Okay. And, and so this, that doesn't apply to this form. And there is a box mark, witnesses to autopsy, which has been checked. Mm -hmm. And there appear to be the names of Van Adder and Lang, LAPD 61494? Yes. And that is to reflect officers Van Adder and Lang were present to observe the autopsy? Yes. Now, if we could flip this to the next form 16. <coughs> now, you mentioned that. This type of form is used to write in a lot of information as the autopsy is performed. Is that correct? Yes. And it also includes a reference to the time over which the autopsy was conducted, the formal autopsy. Is that yeah. correct? Yes. And in this case, is there an entry by Dr. Golden for that time? Yes. And where is that? In the lower part of the form. The autopsy has started at 8.30 and completed at 10.30 from the inscriptions on this form. Your Honor, I'm just going to outline that box with red on this Form 16. Yes. Doctor, also, is there, from an external exam list of uh, areas, an indication by Dr. Golden regarding the height and weight of Ms. Uh, Brown Simpson? Yes. And in this case, is the height listed as 65 inches as I'm outlining in red? Yes. And is the weight listed as 129, we'll assume, pounds? Yes. Thank you. I think we're done with that. Done. And I think we'll go back to the photo board. If we
Doctor, is there anything else that uh, you wish to bring to the attention of the ladies and gentlemen of the jury regarding those four stab wounds or sharp force injuries? No. I'd like to move just briefly to what is obviously a cropped photograph that's right next to you in the lower series of photographs that I believe is marked B10. Is that the designation? You have a better view of it than I, Doctor. Uh, that is correct. Doctor, uh, again, just to be clear, this is cropped pursuant to the order of the court, correct? Yes. And you viewed the full photograph, both in the set of size as these are in general, and also in the life-size photograph, is that correct? Yes. What is shown in B10? It shows a, a small reddish-brown abrasion in the uh, right side of the face, uh, a short distance from the eyebrow area. Now, you talked about an abrasion yesterday being a blunt force trauma type injury, is that correct? Yes. And is the color that you see of that abrasion of any significance to you in evaluating when in relationship to death that injury was received by Nicole Brown Simpson? It was an uh, anti-mortem abrasion. That means it happened when she was alive. And uh, How can you tell? From the appearance of the coloration. What is the coloration? Reddish, the reddish brown color we have here would indicate it's an anti-mortem abrasion. Why is that? Because it shows evidence of vital reaction. Photographically. Vital reaction meaning? That it happened during when the person was alive. Is vital reaction something regarding how the body is reacting? Yes. What is the body reacting? I'd like to get a definition of that. Basically, when you have an injury, I indicated that you will have uh, inflammatory response and uh, sometimes bleeding. Here there's no bleeding, but you have the reddish brown color because of the vascularity of the structures underlying it. And there's no microscopic section available of this area, but looking at it from my experience and the appearance of this wound, it is a wound which happened when she was alive. Doctor, can you identify any source for the abrasion that you see in that photograph? It's a non-specific type of uh, uh, abrasion. There's no pattern to it. So any rough surface could have uh, caused this type of abrasion, which could be uh, uh, any type of rough surface could have caused this, from but depending your, on what kind of uh, uh, items are uh, given as hypothetical situations, we can discuss it further. From your visits to the 875 South Bundy location, and you testified yesterday, you did examine the environmental surroundings there for looking uh, for sources for blunt force trauma. Can you, did you find any that would be consistent with being a source for this particular abrasion identified in B10? Yes, there is a, there's a staircase there and there's a wall before a, a, a metal uh, side wall. And this could be from the wall where there's a rough surface to the wall. And how is that inflicted then between a rough surface of a wall and the uh, area of the body where this abrasion is seen? Well, the head could have been uh, come in contact with the wall. That would be one way, one way it could have been caused. And come in contact in what fashion? Being pushed against the wall. Doctor, could you slide the photograph board? Just slide it down for me. Take a look for a second. Doctor, in your opinion, is that particular abrasion a non-fatal blunt force trauma injury? Yes. Is it of any significance to the cause of Nicole Brown Simpson's death? No. 
is it something which would allow you as a forensic pathologist to identify with specificity the manner in which it was inflicted? No. Is there any way that you as a forensic pathologist can tell us in the sequence of wounds that were received by Nicole Brown Simpson when that was other than to say it was received while she was alive? No. <coughs> Did Dr. Golden describe this particular abrasion in his original autopsy protocol? Yes, he did, and he also diagrammed it. Uh, he described it in page 8 of his autopsy protocol. All right, we'll, we'll, before we move, page 8 and... Diagram 22. All right. If we could ask counsel to move briefly. All right, you put up again B0 and 3B, Your Honor. 3B. And I'm sorry, Dr. Page 8, was it? Yes. I need another few inches to help out. All right, Doctor, can you find on page 8, where there is a description. Uh, fifth paragraph, uh, external injuries of the scalp, uh, small abrasion, reddish brown, measuring 3 8 inch by uh, quarter inch, appearing to be antimortem is found lateral to the eyebrow. Your Honor, uh, may the record reflect that with the red marker, I'm circling that area. I'll write B10 on the left margin of that on page 8 of the Form 12 protocol. Yes. And doctor, would you identify on the uh, Form 22 where Dr. Golden has described it or diagrammed it? Diagrammed it here, and you can see the description here. All right, first of all, where he diagrammed it, I'll circle that area, and this is in the lower left quadrant. I'll draw a line out to the uh, clear area, and I'll write B10 there. And this abrasion description is tiny more red brown. Keep your voice up, doctor. Abrasion, reddish brown, uh, three eight by quarter inch, anti bottom. And I'll circle that area and draw a line to connect to the earlier writing of mine of B10. Is there any um, additional information in the addendum regarding this point? Yes. Uh, the get an addendum on this, and the measurement has changed in the addendum. And this is 8B. Why don't we put it up over the, where we have the protocol. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, where is there a, a reference to this, doctor? Page one. Roman numeral 2, item 2. And I'll circle that on the blow up and write B10 out as a margin. Now, what is the difference, doctor, uh, between what is described here in the addendum and what was initially? Let me hold up. The initial uh, measurement of 3 8 by quarter inch, the revised measurement was half an inch by quarter inch. And doctor, uh, do you have any information from your review of all of the materials on which this revision to the description of that abrasion was made? He made it in addendum, and I, I, I think what happened was he had included this injury in the body of the report under the systemic review, and he thought he probably didn't address it, and then. When he saw the photographs, he addressed it in the addendum, uh, thinking he didn't address it. But I don't have an answer why he called it half inch by quarter inch. I think he measured it from the photograph he had, and he measured it. 
But in fact, the strike is speculation. Sustained. Jury is to disregard the last question. Doctor. And answer. Sorry, Your Honor. Doctor, according to the diagram, that diagram entry that uh, we circled in the lower left side with the B10, that uh, handwritten entry was made at the time of the autopsy by Dr. Golden? Yes. Objection calls for speculation. Over. Your answer, Doctor? Yes. Um, one other thing. Is there anything further on this abrasion? No. Is there any significance to you with respect to the difference in description, half an inch versus quarter inch, three eighths inch by quarter inch, on this particular abrasion, on any of the issues you review? No. And did you measure that particular abrasion from the one to one photograph? Yes, I did. What was your measurement? Seven sixteenth inch by three sixteenth inch. So you have what would be a third series of dimensions for that particular abrasion, is that correct? Is there any significance to you in the difference between your measurements from the one-to-one -one photograph and the two measurements that are provided in the original protocol and the addendum? Uh, not of significance, there is a difference. Is that difference a difference that can be attributed to something other than the limitations of the process of photographic measurement? Uh, no, because there's only one sixteenth inch difference. And given that difference of one sixteenth of an inch, is that difference consistent with the limitations that you've described of photographic measurement? Yes. My arm's getting tired. I'll put that down. We can take the addendum down. As long as we're in this position, one thing I failed to, um, I think, bring out with the protocol and getting back to the very first major stab size wound what we started with this morning of the aspiration of blood. You mentioned something about it being addressed in some fashion in Dr. Golden's protocol. Is that correct? Yes, go to page uh, nine. Keep your voice up, Doctor. We're going to put this back up. I'll switch with Mr. Lynch. And what is of significance here, Doctor? If you look at page 9, the, the paragraph uh, just before the last paragraph of the page, you see injuries to the upper airway, including the incise wound of the hypopharynx and epiglottis have been described. Otherwise, the mucosa of the larynx, pyriform sinuses, trachea, and major bronchi are anatomic. No mucosal lesions are evident, and no blood is present. And is that the basis on which you form an opinion that there was no aspiration of blood by Nicole Brown Simpson from that major stab incised wound? Yes, and also... Uh, Keep your voice up, doctor. And also the next page. All right, before we move to the next page, Your Honor, for the record, I'm outlining with the red marker that paragraph. I'm going to write B, uh, thir let's see, 13... 16, B16, and B18, and the words aspiration of blood on the left margin. Yes. Now, Doctor, the next page. Is that correct? Page, uh, page 10. All right. And Mr. Lynch is. On the lungs, if you look, uh, it says that uh, the lungs. Uh, uh, the suction surface of the lungs show minimal congestion and no injuries or lesions. And that again is consistent with your opinion of an absence of aspiration? Yes. Because if you have aspiration, you will describe it when you section the lungs, you will see the aspirated blood in the distal portion of the airways and you will see it on the section of the lung. And you also examined those sections of lung that were preserved? Yeah, the sections which were preserved I examined. And you found no evidence of that aspiration of blood? Grossly. When you say grossly, what does that mean? On the sections we examined. And Your Honor, I've outlined that area on page 10. I'll again write B13, B16, B18, and aspiration, ASP of blood. Uh, doctor, I, one other thing while we're on this page. We'll flip back to page 9. Is there an entry regarding the cornu, that horn, uh, in Dr. Golden's original protocol that yes. that is not accurate? That is correct. 
All right, if we could flip back to page nine, because I think it's caught in mid-sentence in the flip. Doctor, inviting your attention to the last sentence that begins at the bottom of page 9 and continues then on to page 10. Does this deal with Dr. Golden's um, observation regarding that area, including the hornu or horns? Yes. Uh, he says the hyoid bone and thyroid cartilage are intact in as much as the incised wound passed through the thyrohyoid membrane. And the ligament and both greater cornuas of the thyroid cartilage are intact. Were they, in your opinion, intact? No. The right cornu was uh, cut, and I already addressed it earlier. And that's uh, a matter that is addressed, as you've identified, in Dr. Golden's addendum. Is that correct? Yes. So you're unaware Dr. Lakshmanan has just made mention from um, page 10. I've circled it, and I'll write uh, B13, B16, B18. And I'll write the word horns in quotation marks. Yes, thank you. So, Doctor, the reference here, in your opinion, would be a mistake by Dr. Golden? Yes, because it was incised. The cornu was incised on the right side? Yes. Is that mistake of any significance to you on these issues that we've discussed? I already said it's not of significance because the whole black organs are available and the major injuries have been described. And does it in any way, whether it was nicked or not nicked, impact on the manner, sequence of uh, how she died? No. I think we're done with that.